This marks our third annual gathering at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for the travel industry forecast from leading industry experts. I have a few brief housekeeping remarks before we get started. First, I want to welcome everyone tuning in on our webcast and on Facebook Live. For media listening in and for media in the room, forward your questions to pr at asta.org, and we will make sure that we respond this afternoon. Actually, we also encourage all of our members who are tuning in live on Facebook to let us know where you're listening in from, engage with us throughout this program, and again, media, please forward your questions to pr at asta.org. A copy of this recording will also be available on our Facebook and on our website after this program. Today's program is about possibilities. When we gathered here for the first time in 2021, the conversation was centered around recovery. In 2022, we talked about travel's resurgence and revenge. That was when revenge travel started to become a thing, and we are seeing no signs of that slowing down anytime soon, are we? So this year, as we reflect upon the great travel comeback story, we're highlighting our resilience, and we're inviting more people to join us and to help us meet the growing demand for professional travel advice. Today, you'll hear how we're creating the next generation of travel advisors, because our resilience is found in the stories of our partners and our members who have invested their time, energy, and resources to ensure a bright and lasting future for our industry. You'll hear from women who have built their own businesses and helped others do the same. You'll walk away with a deeper appreciation for America's travel advisors, and we hope that you'll be inspired to join us in recruiting and training new travel advisors in what I think we all consider to be the best industry in the world. So with that, I'd like to invite Zane Kirby, President and CEO of the American Society of Travel Advisors, to kick us off after this short video. Great work uh, led by Erica Richter. Thank you all and welcome. Welcome to the Press Club. My name is Zane Kirby. As Erica mentioned, I'm the President and CEO of the American Society of Travel Advisors. Why are we here? That's not an existential question. <laughs> We're here in Washington, D.C. because promoting our profession is just what we do. ASTA advocates in the halls of Congress, to federal regulators, in state houses across the country, and to the traveling public. We shout the great work that travel advisors do and the essential role you play in the U.S. economy. That is why we're here. Travel advisors are the very picture of 21st, the 21st century workforce. We are entrepreneurs and job creators who are meeting the enormous and growing public demand for travel experiences. This is a profession, as you saw here, with, with truly unlimited earning potential, geographic and uh, schedule flexibility, and one of the only professions when you can wake up every morning loving what you do. That's also why we're here. Now, we're here in DC and here in large numbers because this, despite the developments of fake human algorithmic chatbot solutions, <laughs> our profession is growing. Real people spending real money value empathy, discernment, and product expertise. Those have always been and will always be the tools of our trade. Now, for decades, the hardworking men and women in our industry were told that they were a dying breed. Study after study talked about the countless reasons travel advisors were no longer needed. With all due respect to Phil Collins' famous song, maybe I can get Stephen to sing it for us here, Against All Odds, 
Travel advisor business has never been better. What's somewhat heart heartening is that the public perception seems to finally acknowledge what we've known all along. According to the United States Census Bureau and the Federal Reserve, in the 10 years prior to COVID, travel agency revenue tripled in size from $10 billion to $30 billion a year, staggering growth. The United States La uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics, after years of projecting travel advisor decline, they're now projecting a 20% growth in, in, travel advisor, in the travel advisor industry and much faster than other average industries, which is great. Travel is complex. Time is scarce for all of us, and money is scarce for most of us. <laughs> Would you rather really rely on you know, your own deductive powers or trust someone who has been to New Zealand 20 times and knows all the ins and outs and has built a successful business dispensing valuable advice? You know, what, what would you rather do? I mean, it's, the answer is kind of obvious. Now, and it's no wonder that more and more consumers are reawakening to the need for professional travel advice. In a recent survey, Aston members reported that more than half of their clients are working with a travel advisor for the very first time. That's great news. Now, supplier partners are also responding to a surge in demand. The more people that join our industry to meet that demand, the more the demand seems to grow. Workers toiling in other industries should and are giving a career in travel a new look. At ASTA, we feel duty-bound to play a role in help finding and nurturing the next generation of travel advisors. Now, for years, we provided an overview of the profession, which we sold for about 20 bucks on the ASTA website. We sold a few dozen of those each year. And late last year, so our friends at Norwegian Cruise Line asked if they could help our efforts to attract new talent to the industry. They made a generous contribution to ASA that allowed, a, that allowed us to make this $20 you know, professional overview resource a free resource on our website. Their donation also allowed us to revamp some of our industry orientation training. In the past few months, thousands have downloaded our industry orientation and professional overview, and hundreds are taking ASA's industry roadmap course to becoming a travel advisor, which also includes their first year of ASTA membership. So I want to say an enormous thank you to Frank Del Rio, Harry Sommer, and everyone at Norwegian, as well as Alex Sharp from Signature Travel Network, for fueling our efforts to showcase our industry as a thriving career opportunity. Norwegian's generous support has helped us rapidly build the top of the talent funnel, and we'll nurture this audience and ultimately match them with their best path for selling travel. Let's take a look at a short recruitment video that shows the interesting and varied paths that some of our members have taken to our industry. Their stories are inspiring the next generation of advisors who enrich our community by bringing their experiences and skills from other industries to ours. For 26 years, I worked for the New York City Fire Department uh, as a paramedic, and I retired as a deputy chief. Um, and that was actually where my client base came from. Oh, wow. Um, before, in my previous life, I was a stockbroker about 10 years, and I started to reflect on my life and realizing I was living to work and not working to live. I was working as a TV anchor and entertainment reporter in Palm Springs, California. Before I was a travel advisor, I had a degree in computer science and I was an IT professional. Then I became a mom and I stayed home with my kids and then worked with all of the different places helping them travel and decided why not become an advisor? I love to travel. Being a travel advisor kind of came to me in that I am a military spouse, so I needed a job that I could move up with and be successful with, but that could also move with me. Ironically, one of my friends asked me uh, to help them find a flight. They said, I'm always looking for deals, discounts, best things that get benefits. Uh, I said, how much would you pay me? Uh, so jokingly, that started my career as an advisor. Um, I love to travel and see the world, and so I wanted to also uh, encourage and provide that opportunity for other individuals. I kind of got to the point in my career where I was like, I need a change. And I kind of come by the travel industry pretty naturally because my mom is a luxury travel advisor. She's been working in the industry for about 15 years. And I would see her jetting off to like, gosh, places like India or Bhutan or Kenya. And I would be sitting in the anchor desk and I was like, how do I get to go to those cool places? I took my first ever vacation, international vacation as an adult. My first trip ever was to Jamaica. I caught the travel bug, I came home, my friends and colleagues were asking me how the trip was, I said, I'm going back next year, you're free to come, 
12 of us went the next year and they went and told friends when we came back and within a couple years I'm bringing 250 plus people to Jamaica annually uh, and they were saying you should be a travel agent. I started in the business taking ski groups to Europe, specifically Italy, and then it just grew. My group source, you know, it just kind of grew tentacles out into the, the community where all of those people were from, and my group business really grew and eventually worked up to where I am now, where I'm selling primarily luxury, luxury cruises, river cruises, and I'll do luxury land as well. After my contract was over with the TV station, I decided to kind of take a big leap of faith and join her on a lot of her trips and was sharing kind of like recommendations on what to do. And that kind of spiraled into me launching Gals Broad Getaways and helping other people travel and go to some of the amazing places that we get to go to. Um, being able to work remotely has allowed me to do both of my jobs, being a mom and a travel advisor. And it's also helped me because my passion is travel and seeing the world, so it gives me the opportunity to help others do that as well. To have the freedom to do what you're passionate about, it's not like work. I love what I do. Um, I wake up every day and of what's gonna happen next, what are my challenges. I look at as opportunities to help my clients um, arrange their dream vacation. How am I doing things? How can I do better? How can I market better? What's the newest way that I can reach out and target the right client for the right product? My hope is to expand in those different areas and keep just slowly growing and helping more women travel the world. I'm making more money than I've ever made. Some people say, why didn't I do this soon? I think the financial freedom aspect is travel isn't a hard sale. Uh, what is this trying to find the perfect trip for the perfect person or uh, the excursion you know, that they thought would be a memorable moment, as I like to say. I think with that in mind, um, possibilities are endless, not only for me, but for where I could see other people and helping them to explore. Thank you. In a moment, we're going to hear from John Cherneski from Norwegian Cruise Line. Thank you, John, for being here. Now, when we leave here today, we're going to head to Capitol Hill to spread this message to House members and members of the Senate from all 50 states. We will tell them that we are the job and travel demand creators that fuel the American economy. And our presence here demonstrates that we are a resilient, evolving, and dynamic industry of thriving small businesses, and that we aren't going anywhere. That is why we are here. Thank you for being here with us. Now, please welcome to the stage the Senior Vice President of North American Sales for Norwegian Cruise Line, Mr. John Cherneski. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, my first time in this building, but not my first time in DC, which I will explain as we go through my presentation, I've got about 74 slides. Um, we're, just gonna, we're just gonna zip through them. I live in Los Angeles, have for over 30 years, um, but this area used to be my home. I lived in Northern Virginia for about four years and um, not surprising to this uh, town, a lot of military families are here. Uh, my dad was in the Navy. Uh, I was born in Hawaii when he was in diesel submarines back in the day and moved, I think by the time I was 18, we lived in eight different homes. And so moved around quite a bit. And this was one of my favorite places that I uh, actually lived. Uh, Fairfax High School, uh, pictured here, is where I graduated high school, about 14 miles from here. The high school looked nothing like this when I went there. The only, after a remodel, the only thing they kept were the two trash cans in front from my days, um, but quite an upgrade. Uh, my dad, when he was stationed here, was working in the Pentagon, actually in the Office of Legislative Affairs. And so his job was to help the Navy uh, work with members of Congress all about appropriations and working for the Department of Defense and the budgeting and all that. So um, how many, by show of hands, were raised as kids to watch C-SPAN? Anybody here have to suffer through that as a child? Yeah, Zane, um, it's, uh, it's quite fun. And so that was my childhood. But my dad ended his career as a captain of the battleship Missouri, uh, which was quite an accomplishment. And uh, if you think having a battleship captain as a dad was fun, think again, but it was... Uh, it was something. He passed away at a young age from cancer. Um, Arlington National Cemetery is where he is today. I'm going to go with, visit him later today, make sure he's still there. Um, but if you, ever, if you ever go to Arlington, please go pay him a visit. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty special place, to say the least. Now, I have been in the travel industry and the cruise industry for 30 years. Apparently, back in the day, those pants were something you should wear, the acid wash <laughs> pants. Um, 
And I have the distinct pleasure of leading the sales team now at Norwegian Cruise Line. And uh, at the end of the day, we are there. Uh, I was photoshopped in in a couple places. <laughs> you may have noticed. Hi, Jen. Um, you may have noticed I was inserted there a couple times. But at the end of the day, we, in our role, advocate for travel advisors. That's what we're there to do. And uh, it is an honor to lead this great team. And uh, simply put, we could not do uh, what we do as a company without travel advisor support. We simply could not do it. And uh, we have so many ships in Norwegian, by the way, I couldn't even fit them on this slide. That'll come later. But uh, we truly love travel advisors. And it is so much fun doing what I do every day along with um, my team. And so let's talk about why there are travel advisors today. Zane mentioned it, that um, despite all the other pressures of AI and what have you, travel advisors are still around, but why? And I think it's a long list, I really do. There's so many reasons why travel advisors um, are still here and will be here for a very, very long time. And I think it comes down to many factors, but first and foremost is service. At the end of the day, connecting with people, providing that outstanding service, uh, listening to them, um, ensuring they get a, a great experience and through the process and of course that vacation, whatever that trip might be, is what it's all about. And cruising in particular is complicated. So many decisions that go into it. Where am I going to go? What ship? What itinerary? What cabin? What do I do on board? What do I do with my shore excursions? Do I take travel insurance? You'll note I have travel insurance listed twice. The answer is yes. We came through the pandemic and hopefully we're all buying travel insurance. Um, I put free at sea twice. That's our amenity package where everything is paid for up front. And people have taken that um, uh, and vast, vast majority when they make their bookings are taking it because the travel advisor is talking to their client about what is the best experience for them. At the end of the day, another reason why I think travel advisors are never going away is that time is ultimately our most important asset. We all wish we had more of it. Um, every day we wish we had more time or in our lives and so travel advisors give back time to their clients so they can do whatever it is they want to do um, but I think that's a huge uh, return on investment for working with a travel advisor. And then when you think about the value proposition of what travel advisors are giving and maximizing the value of the experience, value is not about cheap price, value is about paying, you know, you spend money, when you spend money, you get something in return, it's the value is what you get in return, right? And so um, I think that what a travel advisor is allowing their client to do is, you may have to spend a little bit more money, but ultimately your goal as a travel advisor is to ensure your client comes back to you and they think, yeah, I'm so glad I bought that nicer cabin or I did that trip uh, when I was in Istanbul, whatever it might have been. And so that's where I think the travel advisor adds value. And at the end of the day, travel advisors are experts in their field. Um, I chose this picture because it features my good friend Jackie Friedman, who's going to be on the panel later this morning, and her team at Nexion. Um, and I think because of the expertise of travel advisors, we use experts to manage our finances, uh, legal issues, a plumber, buying a house. These are experts in their profession. Travel advisors are experts in theirs, and allowing an expert to help guide you um, is really what it's all about. And I have been very fortunate to have spent uh, many time, uh, many trips in Alaska, over a dozen times, both personal and work trips. And when people find out I work for Norwegian Cruise Line, they say, oh, you guys go to Alaska. I say, yeah, what should I do? I get so excited. I become a travel advisor. I start talking to them about, oh, here's when you should go. Here's what side of the ship you should be on. Here's what you should do when you're in June. Or how long are you going to be there? Can you do both a whale watching and a helicopter trip in the same day? You should definitely do that. And I just, I've never been a travel advisor, but I get excited for uh, what those opportunities are and how to talk to people and get them excited to make sure that they come back thinking, oh man, I'm so glad I took your advice and I did all those great things. So how does the Norwegian Cruise Line support travel advisors? Well, I think there's many things we do behind the scenes. Uh, we're paying commission on NCFs. We've enhanced the commission tiers. Those are kind of the behind the scenes commercial terms. Um, we have a program though that's public facing we call Partners First, and we mean that. And, we're always trying to get better at this each and every day of how we connect with travel advisors from an education standpoint, marketing support, um, all that we do from um, really giving you the tools you need to sell our brand uh, as successfully as you can. And coming through the pandemic and the demand for travel, which is great, at the end of the day, we need more bodies in the place of being travel advisors. We need more people interested. And every industry, at the end of the day, is driven by the workforce that they have. If UPS doesn't have drivers, they're not going to be successful. If Delta doesn't have pilots, they're not going to be flying planes. And we 
need travel advisors as an industry to do all the great work um, that is needed to keep us going. And so uh, we talk about career change in that great video we saw, and I think there are so many opportunities right out of high school, right out of college, get into, be, uh, become a travel advisor, learn the ropes, own your own agency down the road. Um, not many industries you can do that in, and being a travel advisor is definitely one of them. And so uh, whether you're late in life or right out of school, there's opportunities to join. And I want to tell a quick story. Why am I showing a picture of a dairy farm? Um, many of you may have remembered John Haskins um, and his wife Peg. Uh, I was on uh, our Norwegian Bliss in Alaska for a signature event, and we were having dinner. With, I was with about six travel advisors. I had never met Peg before, and I'm sitting across from her. And lo and behold, I find out, in addition to being a travel advisor running an agency, her family also owns and operates a dairy farm. I said, what? A dairy farm? Hold everything. We spent the next hour just talking about dairy farming. 1,200 head of cattle, 3,000 acres. I was so fascinated by it. And I thought, well, how do you do both? And so that's, I think, the great thing about this industry is that you can oftentimes do both. You can be a mom. You can be a travel advisor. You can be a dairy farmer. You can be a travel advisor. It's pretty uh, endless what the opportunities are. So clearly, we are hiring, and we are looking forward to people looking for opportunities to come in, which is why Norwegian made the large investment that we did and partnering with our great friends at ASTA uh, to do um, what is needed to do uh, to drive demand. Um, power of travel, at the end of the day, you talked about it, Zane. What we all do is fantastic. We are getting people to experience the world, and I like to think that our society gets better with every trip that we all take, you know, cultural breakdowns and understanding what other people go through in their daily lives, and uh, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to travel. I love this quote by Susan Sontag talking about, um, you know, I haven't been everywhere, but it's on my list. I am one of those people that has a bucket list of travel, and I'm sure you all do too. But travel makes us better as people, and that's why I, I love being uh, in this industry. And my boys, I have twin boys, my wife and I have twin boys that are 16, and uh, they have been on 14 cruises. And so they have traveled the world. We have been to the Caribbean, Hawaii, Alaska, um, Mexico, uh, French Polynesia twice. They've been to French Polynesia twice and they're only 16 years old, super spoiled. <laughs> Japan. Um, but those experiences mean everything to us as a family and I'm sure you all do the same with yours and it really is a special industry for us to be in. Um, I want to thank Asta. I want to take a moment uh, to call out Zane and Evan and Erica and everybody on the team coming through the pandemic and the work that was done behind the scenes, which was, you talk about 24-7, not enough time in the day. Um, just amazing dedication and sacrifice that was made. Keeping this industry alive as best you could um, is not to be forgotten anytime soon. It's greatly appreciated by all of us in the industry. And um, you know, in this town, uh, there's, uh, with obviously politics here and you become president of the United States, it's, it ages you, right? The stress of the job ages you. And you look at President Obama, before and after, he aged. Ladies and gentlemen, Zane Kirby's only 26 years old. <laughs> It doesn't stop, um, so thank you, Zane. Um, I'm standing here as the head of sales for Norwegian Cruise Line, but my sister brands, Oceana and Regent, were all part of the same uh, family of brands, and the investment that we made was part of all of us and our support because uh, we like to think that while our family of brands has something to offer everybody, we really believe that we all need travel advisors, and that's why the investment um, was made. And if you think of what I think one of the most important um, elements of being a travel advisor is qualifying your client and making sure you're putting them on the right product, the right ship. And so uh, we like to think we have something for everybody, a uh, Norwegian family. Uh, clearly Norwegian, we visit almost 400 places around the world, so we're very uh, thrilled with that. But it is really about qualifying to make sure you're putting them on the right brand. It is so important. And we've got a few ships. I think I mentioned this before. We've got a few ships to fill. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how proud I am to work for a company that offers a discount for the members of our military. Uh, near and dear to my heart, and so it was, thr it was thrilling for me to join this family and to know that we are giving back to the people that have served. Um, we're standing here um, in the National Press Club, and since 1908, this building has stood, and um, if you think back to the founding fathers and what they tried to set up, three branches of government and a free press that could keep everybody honest, um, it is an honor for me to be in this building, let alone standing on the stage. And so with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, it has been uh, my pleasure to be here. Yeah, the picture again. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, someone who's going to join in just a second, uh, Gloria Bohan, 
who is going to give a speech, and we're going to show a video of her first. But um, Gloria's story is incredible, and uh, I am not worthy of sharing this same stage. When you look at your career, it is truly remarkable. And so I just want to say thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Look forward to connecting with all of you over the next couple of days. Let's see the video. Growing up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, I never imagined I'd be telling the story of how I built a 50-year-old company that's still growing. My grandfather raised his family of seven, including my father, Michael Spinelli, in an apartment above the Italian restaurant he owned on Mulberry Street. My mother, Lillian, was a pianist and kept her home filled with music, which my sister, Lucille, and I just loved. New York played a big part in shaping my personality. I went to Marymount Manhattan College, and I had high hopes of being in business, but my path led me to teaching and to a job at Forbes Magazine, all experiences that would help me later. Just before Labor Day 1969, fate led Daniel Boham, a friendly guy carrying a red water cooler, to my towel on a West Hampton beach where he tempted me and my friend Eileen with all kinds of libations and food. Yep, Dan liked to do things in a big way. After a year of dating, we were married at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Dan's mother, Mary, and an avid cruiser encouraged us to have our wedding reception and honeymoon on the QE2. The ship upgraded us to a suite, provided I wear my wedding gown again for an article in the ship's newsletter. Wow, what a deal. This trip would forever change my life and begin the journey known as Omega World Travel. We dreamt for a year of returning to the QE2, but when we did, there were no upgrades because the suites were being held by travel agents on a familiarization trip. I complained to Dan, my biggest cheerleader, who said, if you can't beat him, then join him. So I did. Dan's real estate business brought us to Fredericksburg, Virginia, where I had the smaller side of the office and he had the larger. We later switched as Omega grew. Customers suggested we move farther north to service them. I pursued school trips, chartered aircraft, and was delighted when cruises started out of Norfolk. With the popularity of the 747 and new air routes, worldwide travel attracted businesses. When we went on computers in 78, it triggered high growth, and along with deregulation, we saw lower fares and airline perks, such as two-for-one coupons. Soon, we had four offices in the Washington, D.C. area, and even started a 24-hour hotline. The government wanted its share of new business services, and we succeeded in winning a large contract that catapulted our growth. Soon, they coined the phrase, Travel Management Center. We made the Inc. 500 list in 1985, the same year as Microsoft. By the early 90s, we had over 200 offices and went global with our international office in London. USA Today cited us as a pioneer in business travel. Commission cuts and the internet worried us, but we wanted to be an online player. So we went back to our roots and planned to book cruises online. That was the start of Travtech and Cruise.com. A far out opportunity came along when the space agency asked me to speak about the commercialization of space travel, which led me and other entrepreneurs to the startup of space adventures, which later led us to see the first tourist in space. The 2000s brought high points, but also the terrible loss of Dan, who had been hospitalized for almost seven years. His courage and spirit lives on with us here at Omega. Omega has faced its share of challenges, but also many accolades and awards. I have even been named godmother of two ships. I have great staff and suppliers who have given me much support over the years. I am devoting myself to supporting the industry's growth and to fostering innovation and entrepreneurship through the Dan and Gloria Bohan Foundation. 
Thank you for this incredible honor. I really appreciate being here today, and I just want to say that I know so many of you in the audience, and I want you to know I admire you very much, and I appreciate all that you do. And I want to say that it's also an honor to welcome you to today's kickoff uh, of the ASTA Legislative Day events. I've participated in some of the past, and wear very, very comfortable shoes. Uh, and many thanks also to Norwegian Cruise Line for their active support of travel advisors on that beautiful, beautiful video. It's also thrilling to be here, like uh, John was saying, in the National Press Building, because uh, I live in the Washington area, and uh, I used to have an office on the mezzanine floor. And it was quite, quite interesting to, at that time, meet all of the writers and famous people. But it was always curious because people always wanted to talk to somebody in travel. So like many of you who live in local communities, you probably uh, get a lot of exposure to your uh, deals and so forth if you follow uh, the invites of the press to speak about travel. Because I know I did, and it really helped. So as you can see by the video, cruising propelled me into this great travel and hospitality industry. Along the way, I did sidetrack into all facets of travel, and I'm very grateful for the helping hand of ASTA <laughs> over these 50 years. It was their correspondence course, home correspondence course, that taught me industry basics in the early years. So I always remember that and remind ASTA about that. If you can't beat them, join them, was my husband's advice as I left teaching to start a travel agency. I knew I needed an experienced manager to gain my certification, but I didn't realize how necessary it was to know my business fully and fast. People in my little town of Fredericksburg liked to deal with local folks they knew, and I'd better know my business because I could not sit in the back office like I thought I might and uh, sort of count count my money, but I had to make the money. So yes, uh, it was very important to get involved, being very hands-on. And I looked to vendors, too, for content. Uh, yet it was always Aster who provided some of that training with their courses, constant updates on rules, laws, and those glorious seminars at sea, along with the great chapter networking. All that still exists today, and I hope more and more of you take advantage of those opportunities. So again, thank you, Esther. Travel is a great job creator, as we've been saying, and a long-term profession. Uh, a chance to participate in one of the really largest sales distribution networks in the world. And I always wonder why more vendors don't use our sales distribution network. And I think that with the success that we're showing in growth here, uh, with advisors and so forth, that you're, you're going to see that opportunity continue despite the internet. The personal touch is very important. My first employee was a 76-year-old woman who seems a little young to me today. <laughs> <laughs> and at that age, she found a new mission in life by helping young people start a travel business, would you believe? She mentored me and taught me sales. So in gratitude to her memory and to the many people that I've met over the years, my vendors, suppliers, customers, employees, <laughs> I uh, started with my husband, the Dan and Gloria Foundation, Bohan Foundation, whose mission is to foster entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial spirit within travel and business. I am so happy to have asked to participate with the foundation each year in naming and awarding the Entrepreneur of the Year. We have seen many great ideas emanate from this initi initiative, including technology products, a successful hosted network, who happens to be here, innovation using social media and CRM innovations. One winner, who I spoke with yesterday, and I was very happy to reach her, 
she said that she is really th seeing things moving, and she utilizes a lot of the local chapter people and experts in her, in her area. So the local chapters are really, really important to be involved with. I firmly believe travel and hospitality is an oasis for creativity. I myself keep going on for all, have kept on going on for, on for all these years because of the need and opportunity to innovate. I developed a balanced core business that has uh, sustained decades of economic and worldwide events. Yes, we've been affected by the pandemic. Yes, it was a struggle. Yes, we had to remain open. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, even no matter what, we tried to keep all of our core people employed during that time. And we did have to make sacrifices, as so many of you have, and I congratulate you for, for making it happen, <laughs> coming back. And with a developed uh, a core business that had a lot of diversity, it really has helped me. So it's, a, it's actually uh, one of the things that I think is so important. We can't really make ourselves too narrow in, in what the products are that we have to offer. I am surprised, but I also have learned what people can do given the chance. And that's one of the great, great uh, things I've learned. I try to figure out what ignites their creativity and unexplored talent. And I think as an owner, that's really important to do. The incredible thing is that you can be anything in travel and can have that long-term profession, as John was saying and saying. So I thought I'd just rattle off a couple of things, but then it's not merely, nearly what it can be. But since you're going to see so many congressmen and senators tomorrow, it's nice to remind them. <laughs> OK, so you can be an agent, advisor, writer, sales trainer, technology expert, artist, social network. You can be an influencer, <laughs> would you believe? I didn't even know what an influencer was until about three years ago. OK. <laughs> I learned firsthand. I wondered, what were they talking about, influencer? And then I met an influencer, and she seemed so happy. I mean, happier than I'd ever seen anyone. And she was relaxing, and she was, she was sipping wine. And I thought, what does she do? <laughs> so obviously, the independent consultants are a big deal, the owner, tour conductors. You can even be a doctor on a ship, but it goes on and on. And our hospitality industry is booming. I always tell those who are thinking about becoming a travel advisor that it's a great people business, which can lead to many things in the industry. And I think advisors should always hone in on their expertise and develop a niche market. If you have a passion for art, quilting, sports, uh, plant-based foods, go on. Find those who want to travel with like-minded people. Use all of the resources of the industry. And yes, ask for training and involvement for sure. Take whatever training the hotels, resorts, airlines offer. You know all that. Give travel presentations, invite vendors, and mix with your local community. Some of this advice uh, I was asked to talk about a little bit by Astra, so I, I know a lot of you know about it, but uh, it doesn't hurt to repeat, I guess. And I received a lot of support from local folks, young and older, when asked for special travel tours, and they remained loyal customers throughout my 50 years. The very first ones might not always be here to tell me, but I have nice notes. I maintain a positive attitude. Uh, the business has helped me remain positive. I pay attention to what, what my heart is telling me, what my instincts are. Uh, you have to tap into your creativity and share your knowledge. Very important. It builds respect and credibility. I asked to ask me what I would do over, knowing what I know now. Well, I did ask for, you did ask for one thing, Asta, but I have many, but yet honestly, Early on, I saw that the strength of outside sales agents was uh, very important because it's now called, of course, independent consultants. But I grew up, as you saw, in the New York area. And there was always the travel companies that had what you call outside sales agents. And looking back, I would say that that was probably something I should have done because I had a lot of leisure offices and it was always hard to find people who could maybe 
get started with new clientele. So that's one, one thing, and we're certainly seeing the, uh, the uh, advantages of the independent counselors and advisors. So at my company, we're 50 years and we're still counting. I don't think I would stop because uh, my business has become like a family. Uh, we used to say the sky's the limit. Now we have the limitless depths of space. How about that? To discover and great oceans below that we're exploring with some of the newest expedition ships. So I applaud you all for what you do. And I want to thank you for uh, being great, uh, great examples for me uh, as I've, your competitors in some ways, but you're also part of the industry that I truly love. So I want to thank you for your time today. It's an honor to be here. And I want to take a few minutes uh, to also uh, call uh, John Chernesky to the stand. And for a special note. So you can just, don't be embarrassed. Uh, no, you're not going to. Come all the way up? Yes, come all the way. You could maybe be over there. I, will, I promise you're very, very tall, so I can't. So don't intimidate me with your height. Okay. I, no, no, stand over oh, okay, here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Uh, no, it's all right. Don't, you can get a little closer. <laughs> Not too close. Oh, look okay, at this. I would like to thank Norwegian Cruise Line for your support today, and I am holding here a couple of advertisements that I ran 50 years ago wow. in local newspapers here in the greater Baltimore and Washington area. So I'd show the audience. I used to pour over these ads, and do everything myself with a, a special exacto knife <laughs> and rubber cement. Okay. Um, so they ran and featured the Norwegian Cruise Line's MS Southward. And some of you probably maybe have traveled on the Southward, uh, which opened up cruising to our ports, our local ports, yeah. in those early years. So I want to say to you, I thank you for me, and, uh, wow. and keep, it, keep it up. You've done wonders. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you, Gloria. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I would be remiss not to take a few moments to say, not only is Gloria the godmother of two ships, but she's also the godmother of a lot of us in this room in terms of travel, particularly this powerhouse panel we've got. We stand on the shoulders, stand on the shoulders of Gloria. My name is Denise Jackson, and I am the president and CEO of Balboa Travel. And you are in for a treat. Look at these fabulous ladies. Not only are they beautiful, but they're very smart. <laughs> and you're gonna learn some things from them today. I'm not gonna take time to introduce them, but I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. So, Jackie, if we'd start with you, can you please tell us who you are, what you do for a living? If you have something to do with travel, that would be great. <laughs> how long you've been in the business and how did you get to your current role? Well, hi everyone, I'm Jackie Friedman. Uh, by day, I am the president of Nexion Travel Group. Uh, by night, I am the chair of the board of the Ask Board of Directors. Uh, I have been in the industry for almost 40 years. Uh, and I got into the industry by accident. Uh, I graduated with a degree in music composition and realized I didn't have talent uh, to make it into the industry. So I was one of those kids that came out of school and I had no idea what I wanted to do. And my mom finally sat me down and she said, I don't care what it is, but I want you to find something that you love and that you can build a career around. And I had relatives in the travel industry. I reached out to them. They convinced me that uh, it was the right thing to do. Uh, so in the mid-80s, I guess 84, I <clears throat> became what, exactly what you guys, many of you do. I was a frontline travel advisor. And I did that for about five years. I actually had the opportunity of starting a new agency, which was a great experience. Uh, and from there, I went on to work with Sabre Travel Network up in Canada. And I worked through a number of different jobs there. And that's where I realized 
that even if you are an employee working for someone else, if you see something, say something. And I noticed an opportunity uh, in our industry. Uh, we were up in Canada at the time, uh, growing very, very quickly. And uh, so I went to leadership, uh, and they gave me the opportunity to dig into the issue. And from there, uh, it really catapulted my career. Uh, I moved down to Dallas uh, and did some uh, jobs with Sabre running their sales center of excellence until Sabre bought a little business called Nexion uh, that was in the Silicon Valley, really a technology solution. Uh, you talk about entrepreneurs. They saw a need when the airlines were cupping, uh, capping and cutting commissions to uh, work differently and they created this technology. And from there, uh, it was a great opportunity. I have been there since the early uh, 2004. Today, what I love most is that I have the opportunity to work with individuals and help develop entrepreneurs. I work with almost 5,000 of them. And just seeing uh, them being able to start a business at a very low cost and do something that makes them happy, sell something that people want to buy. And I can't think of any other industry I'd love to be in. Thank you. Melinda. Hi, I'm Melinda Fortunato. I'm the president of Best Travel, and I serve as an ASTA chapter president for the Central Atlantic chapter, which is Maryland, most of Virginia, and Washington, D.C., and I also serve on the Nexion Advisory Board. Um, my path to the industry started really young, actually. I was a military brat. My dad was in the Air Force, and I was fortunate enough to live in Korea and Antigua. So I learned very early to really love and appreciate different cultures, people, food experiences, and I always knew somehow, some way, I want to travel to be part of my life. So fast forward many years later, I met my husband in college, and he was in the Army, and we got married a few years later. And uh, traveling around as a military spouse, you, uh, back then there weren't as many remote jobs, and um, I worked for the Army in a couple of destinations, locations, and my role was to get soldiers and their families excited about their next duty station. So. <laughs> you know, telling them all the wonderful things about Fort Polk, Louisiana, and uh, Fort Irwin, California, you know. And so I think back on that now, and I see the similarities, but now I get to tell people how amazing Greece and Italy are. Um, so we lived in Germany for five years. Both of my children were born there. And then we, when we moved back to the United States, I, uh, we used a travel advisor for our own vacation. And I thought, OK, it's time. This, this is what I want to do. I want to be a travel advisor. So I got a certification at a local college, and I uh, worked part-time at a brick and mortar. And then I opened Best Travel in 2014. Um, I'm an independent contractor under Nexion. And um, most of my business is premium to luxury, customized vacations to Europe. And it's, I would say the last 10 years, the journey that I've had is not what I expected at all. Um, the community, the opportunities, the resources that are available to us is just incredible. And uh, I mean, we'll talk about the business models and different things. You can really run your business the way you want to. So it's been really, really amazing for me to be able to grow as a business owner, grow my business. 95% of my, my um, clients are referrals and, um, and work with such a great community. I'm very, very thankful to be able to do something that I'm passionate about for my work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Keisha. Denise. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Asta, for giving me the opportunity to be here amongst these inspiring female leaders. Um, I'm Keisha Adriano, CEO and President of TravelWise International. We are a 35-year-old family business. Um, I'm a female entrepreneur. I serve on the board with um, the Central Atlantic chapter amongst um, Melinda, and I also am now participating with the government and political committee. So our story began 35 years ago with my mother-in-law, who actually was an immigrant from the Philippines. Um, she came over working in the medical field. She had three kids, and she, she wanted a better life. She wanted the American dream. She wanted ownership. She wanted entrepreneurs. She wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so she actually opened up a storefront here in Washington, DC. Um, and if you could imagine, if you know my husband, um, skateboarding through Washington, DC, making flyers, hanging up on the buildings, 
and um, handing out those physical tickets back in 1989. So um, from there, I think, it, well, fast forward 15 to 15 years ago, my husband and I decided to take it over when my mother-in-law just out of nowhere calls us and says, hey, I'm ready to retire. Um, would you like this? And we were like, why wouldn't we? So at that time, I'd only been to Dominican, um, I think, to Dominican and uh, Jamaica. So, but it was really our first trip to Europe that I fell in love with travel, and I knew this is exactly what I wanted to do. So here I am today, the fourth successor of our family business. And again, just to let people know that you can be a part-timer, you can um, think of this as a job opportunity, because it was the pandemic that really I felt that I was needed in leadership. So that's where I found my passion, that's what I'm basically focused on is leadership and development, helping travel advisors understand that they can have the confidence that they need to be successful in this industry. Thank you. <laughs> Tiffany. Hi, um, I am Tiffany Hines, uh, President and CEO of Global Escapes Travel in Athens, Georgia. I too have been in the industry for 35 years. Um, started as a college student when my uh, mother opened our agency and had never really traveled. Um, had always, you know, uh, when, well, when we first opened our office, I can remember sitting on the floor of our office before we even had furniture and boxes of brochures showing up and just being mesmerized by all of the, the destinations and places, and it was fascinating. Um, I started as a leisure advisor, and uh, we at the time we did leisure and corporate. The, the same people did both tasks, and um, <clears throat> it was uh, destined, I guess, for me to eventually take over the company. Um, reflecting back to a note one of my kindergartner teachers sent home saying I was a little bossy. Um, I guess, <laughs> reflected that I would eventually step into leadership. I'd like to think now I'm a little better leader than just being bossy, but um, <laughs> I've always been, I think, forward thinking and um, exploring the possibilities. And, and now I really enjoy the idea of developing people. And I think um, growing up with uh, a mother who raised me as a single parent, it was really important for me to create opportunities for other women, especially. Um, there's room for everybody in our industry, but for women in particular who wanted to have a family and also have a career. Um, I'm a Gen Xer, and I think that our generation has really been faced with, you need to make a choice of one or the other, and a lot of people uh, working outside the home can be very difficult. And I think our, our, our industry really lends itself well to that aspect of having a family and flexibility. And, you know, we've been remote since way before the pandemic. And it's really kind of, you know, fast forwarded things for our industry. But there are so many opportunities like Gloria mentioned as far as um, whether you're a leader or whether you're a travel planner or whether you're even someone who really enjoys administrative work or marketing or influencing, there are just so many opportunities in, in, our, excuse me, in our industry right now. And it's, um, it's exciting. It's exciting, especially after the last couple of years that we've been through, to see it booming the way it is. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> So as I said, um, I'm Denise Jackson, again with Balboa Travel, and I started my career in travel by trying not to be in travel. <laughs> I was actually going to college. I have something similar to just about everybody on the panel, and it paid for school. I was child number three, and they ran out of money after number two and said, <laughs> get out there and pay your way. Um, but my father claimed it was even prior to that because I was a military brat as well, and I lived in five countries before the age of five. So he claims that's really what started it. And after that time, I ended up joining Balboa Travel 37 years ago. So I've been doing this just a little, just a little longer than most. But um, in that time, like Gloria said earlier, I found speaking up either helped, got you fired, or promoted. <laughs> so promoted was 
key to me, particularly because there weren't a lot of women leaders. There are a lot of women in travel, but there certainly aren't a lot of women at the sea level. And that was particularly important to me as a minority woman. The statistics are even worse than you can imagine, less than 1% in some cases. Um, so I wanted to be the first. I went to school for radio and TV broadcasting. Oprah took my job. <laughs> so I decided, let's try it somewhere else. So I had the opportunity to move through the ranks with great leaders, uh, founders of the company, and we've been in business for 52 years. And as I said, I've been there 37 of the 52. So a lot of change. Uh, we, again, we were looking for opportunities because if you haven't heard the resonating thing through all the speakers today, we're hiring. The travel industry is hiring. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So you have to be creative. And in 2001, that's when we started home basing agents that are W-2 employees, not ICs. And we, have, we used to have 33 offices that are just two today because people are working remotely, our agents. So keep those things in mind as you face challenges in moving forward in your business. And again, as Glory also touched on, she's a wise woman. Diversify your business. So of course, I'm <laughs> representing corporate travel today, but also uh, we have a strong meetings division and we handle leisure travel as well. So we like to keep our fingers in everything. So with that said, speaking of new entrants into the uh, industry, I'm going to ask the panel, what makes this industry unique and a unique opportunity specifically for newcomers? Tiffany? Um, I think the flexibility is the biggest thing. Um, being able to grow and learn um, in an industry where you can start out as a leisure advisor, you can move over to a corporate advisor, you can work from home, you can work from um, the sand in Mykonos if you want to, as long as you have an internet connection. Um, of course, who would want to do that, though? Um, <laughs> but I think it's just the flexibility. I think it, it's just... And, and now more than ever, I think that's what people are looking for. We've heard so much over the last couple of years about people quietly quitting and, um, you know, they're, they've kind of reflected on where they are in their life. And so many people we all know that are in the industry, so many of our clients, that's on their list is to travel once they get, you know, later in life and when they retire. And I think there's just such an opportunity for us to help those people. Um, so flexibility to me is just the number one. <clears throat> Without a doubt. And I guess we could look at this as it could be a job or a career. Right. That's how you look at it. What would you add to that, Keisha? I would expand on that a little bit because um, for me, I have three kids. You know, I, um, I want to be present in my children's life. So this industry has given me the opportunity to create my own schedule, to take off when I need to. Um, and it's also given me the opportunity to, to go to swimming classes and, and, and um, be there and present and create time for my children. Um, and also the, the, the accessibility of education and resources such as ASTAS, what ASTAS is bringing to the, um, to the platform, it's no matter what you are an expert in, whether it's marketing, accounting, graphic design, web design, we are looking for all facets of, of this industry. So if you are just looking to dabble and, and not sure if this is for you, just jump on the website. I know there, there's a roadmap to being a travel advisor. Look through it and just see if this is for you. Great. How about you, and Melinda? So I would say, you know, a lot of travel advisors have worked remotely for a long time. Um, working remotely used to mean mostly working from home. And now, as Tiffany said, you can work from anywhere in the world and utilizing the technology that's available to us. Um, our true value, I feel, is the human connection that we provide and the relationships that we have with our clients. And so technology allows us to maintain that human connection uh, with our clients no matter where we are in the world. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity. And I love that there's so many destinations that are marketing themselves as destinations to come and work remotely. So that is something I think that is new and is different in the last few years. Um, and then all the business models that are available. Um, again, we're, you know, thinking about a work-life balance, you can find the right business model that is, is perfect for you, whether you want to be an employee, whether you want to be an independent contractor, whether you want to be an entrepreneur and, and create your own brand. 
Um, there's so many different ways to do it. So it's, there's a lot of opportunity out there. I guess I'm taking us home. Uh, so I'm going to take a slightly different perspective, one of uh, 10 years of experience we've had in a program that brings new people into the travel industry. Uh, and we ask them this question. We ask, why did you get into the travel industry? What was it about uh, the industry that really appealed to you? And there are really several things. Uh, number one, there's a, you know, a fundamental love of travel. Number two, it's a great opportunity to pair something, a passion or an interest or a hobby that you might have with a business opportunity. And we're seeing a lot of people doing that uh, where they're really specializing, they're finding a niche. And very often that niche is something that they are passionate about. It's something that they know a lot of people uh, who share that same interest. And it becomes the foundation of a great business. We also talk to a lot of people that frankly were not really happy in corporate America. They went to work, very often they might have made a good living, but it didn't really light their fire. You know, they didn't have that love. So uh, this gives people an opportunity to work in an industry, as Melinda said, regardless of how they may want to do it, making people happy. And it is just a great opportunity, whether it's something you're starting straight out of college, whether it's something that may be an encore career, maybe you've had a career uh, in corporate America and now you're ready to uh, try being an entrepreneur. It's also great as a retirement career. Uh, you know, folks, they retire and they're not ready to do nothing. They love to travel. They've always been the ones, perhaps, that uh, booked family vacations. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of that as well. So regardless of where you are in, uh, in life, it can be a wonderful career. It is contagious, I'm going to warn you. Uh, it gets into your blood. There is no cure. <laughs> so true. It's so true. I, I would also add that if you are thinking of a career change, you've got to figure out how to do it. And if you didn't hear it earlier, ASK is a good place to start. So not only do they have modules on how to become the most wonderful travel advisor on the planet, but they're, going to, they're continuing the series and they're coming up with different facets of travel that may pique your interest. Once that's finished, then they hand them off to all of us who are desperately looking for people. And most of us have internal training. I know Jackie. Jackie's company, for example, has started their own corporate travel training program for anybody. You don't have to work for her company in order to take advantage of that. We do something similar, and we partner also with Casto Travel um, with training as well. So these are very good resources at your fingertips, and it all starts with ASTA. So that was to give you a moment to breathe before I ask you the next question, Jackie, mm -hmm. which is, how has the industry evolved? No jokes about COVID. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I started, uh, how many of you know, remember what an OHRG is or an oh, OAG? Yeah. It was the size of a phone book, and that's uh, we made hotel, international hotel reservations using telex. Remember telex? Oh, yeah. uh, you know, it was a very, very different world. I worked in a retail travel agency. People walked in. Marketing was what kind of display could you have in your window? and uh, people walked in and, and you sold travel. So obviously, uh, the business has changed a lot. I believe it's changed for the better because it gives you many options into how you operate. Uh, technology really has been key because when I started, there were outside sales agents, but they had to come into the office to issue their tickets and to pick up their documents and to deliver everything. Uh, there really wasn't the opportunity back then to be truly uh, virtual. Today, it's a completely different world. Uh, travel advisor, ASTA, uh, it wasn't an accident that ASTA changed the name of our association from the American Society of Travel Agents to the American Society of Travel Advisors. Right. Because when I started, I was an agent for the airline. I booked an airline ticket, printed money, went to the next one, and it was a very different job. Today, you are consultants, your advisors, you are um, in many ways uh, therapists. Uh, you, wear, <laughs> you wear many hats, but at the end of the day, you add a value like never before. And you have to 
be a marketer. You have to be a salesperson. You have to be uh, an accountant. You have to wear all of those roles because today it is a business and not a transaction like it was when I got started. Okay, Linda? And so again, um, and also with what Jackie was saying, our, uh, being a travel advisor, we're advising, we're experts, we're consulting, we're, we're not just writing plane tickets and booking plane tickets. And, um, and so really knowing our clients and really developing relation, lifelong relationships with them is the goal. Um, and that means knowing them, knowing their families, knowing uh, how they want to travel, what they love to do, what they don't love to do. And, and I think all of that we were doing before and we were, you know, there's, there was a sense of trust there when someone is spending a lot of money and giving you, you know, the, their memories um, to, to plan. But I think during COVID, that trust was solidified when you think about 2020, um, the cancellations, the hours and the months that we all spent on cancellations while we were losing money, but to make sure that our clients got their money back or got credits or, um, and, and then in 2021, as the world slowly started to open and we were trusted by our clients to send them all over the world when the vaccine requirements and the testing requirements were constantly changing every single day. And we were all trying to keep up and figuring out what the accurate resources were to do that. And they trusted us to get them there and get them home safely. And so, and now while, thank goodness, we are past those, those couple of years, uh, it's still complicated and they are still trusting us. But I think that that really solidified that trust and it solidified um, our expertise in the industry and where our need is. So that's really, I think, has uh, been a lot of the evolution of our industry. And, and I will also expand on both what Jackie and Melinda said. I, the evolution of the travel agent to the travel advisor, I think, is extremely important. Um, and also the recognition of the industry knowing the importance of the travel advisor in the trip planning process. So the evolution of the consumer, the industry, everyone working almost in cohesiveness and understanding what it takes to actually um, create that perfect, memorable vacation for each client. Yeah, I agree with everything uh, said. Uh, I think it, it's been interesting for me to go from a time of um, handwriting tickets, and we use the term plating uh, airline tickets and things now, and I sometimes pull out the device that we physically plated on um, just to kind of provide some historical perspective. But we went from a very transactional uh, business model to much more of, I think it was always there along, but I think over the years as things have evolved, it is ultimately human compassion. It is ultimately people caring about people. Um, and on March 13th, when we sent our team home to work um, for, at that time, we didn't realize you know, how long it would be. I told them all, you know, take your computers, um, reach out to your clients to make sure they're okay. This is not about selling travel. This is about checking on people because we're in such uncertainty we need to just make sure that everybody is okay. And I think that is ultimately where the advisor really shines is that we are the compassion. The computer is the technology and the tool that we use to get the job done, but it doesn't care. Mm. It's black and white. There's no gray there. Um, it's the humans. And then through the pandemic, we just, we evolved to this place of now we see such a surge it's obvious that we need that human connection and we need to explore our planet. Without a doubt, and speaking of the surge, I have some statistics for you. This is not a business that's just surging with uh, existing customers. It's one in which new customers are coming in. So 27% of travel advisors report that more than half of their clients are using a travel advisor for the very first time. Can you imagine that? For the very first time. 50% of people are more likely to use a travel advisor today than they were in the past. That's a 14% increase over last year. All of that, well, 68% of people that are in the industry are talking about the complexity of booking travel. It is more complex. And I don't care what you're selling, if it's leisure travel or corporate travel, the complexities continue 
to be there and there's a disconnect that we're hoping that things catch up over time. And thanks to ASTA speaking about it on the Hill with certain carriers, hopefully some of that <laughs> will pass as well. Nobody mentioned this, so I'm going to have you all repeat it. We work for a fee, not for free. <laughs> Say it with me. We work, work for a fee and not for free. free. <laughs> I think that's been something that's changed over time. And ASTA had a credo last year that they put out, asking all of us to do that in our businesses to make sure we're aligned and that, like other professional organizations that John mentioned earlier, we get paid for the value of what we provide. So don't forget that. OK. For someone who's thinking about becoming a travel agent, a travel advisor, excuse mm -hmm. me, I've dated myself again. <laughs> what are the three things you could tell them? And I'm going to start with you, Tiffany. What are three things? Or if you can only think of one or two, that's OK. There's no penalty. I have three. OK. <laughs> um, I think first and foremost is um, authenticity. I think you need to be very authentic. If you're going to connect with people, um, you're going to care about people, you're in sales, you have to do it authentically. Because um, if you don't, people can see through that. Um, and then um, the second thing is you have to have optimism. For goodness sakes, if you're going to be in this industry, you have to have a lot of optimism. Um, you have to believe that the world can be a better place. You have to believe that um, travel enriches the human experience. You have to believe that the more you help your clients go to other places, that it expands their mind and their understanding. Um, and so that just is the optimism. And you have to have that optimism to get through all the challenges that we, we constantly go through every five to 10 years. Um, and then the third, I think, is you absolutely must be insatiably curious. Um, these three things happen to be our core values at our company, but not just insatiably curious about the world, but about people, about everything. You have to be um, constantly learning and developing yourself and helping others. And I just think those three things are so important. Keisha? Three tips for newcomers. Um, entrepreneur mindset, community, and fearlessness. If you are trying to be successful in this industry, you have to come in with that entrepreneur mindset. You have to come in with a business plan, a commitment. Um, all of these are needed when, when you are trying to build a career in this industry. Number two, community. Entrepreneurship is and can be very lonely. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a community, it doesn't have to be travel advisors. It, it has to be like-minded entrepreneurs. They have to be professionals. Um, but surround yourself with people who are inspiring you, who are challenging you and, and motivating you to be more successful. And then number three, fearlessness. You have to sell yourself. You have to sell the products that you have. So don't worry about being perfect. Don't worry about, I want this to be this certain way before I let it fly. So just get out there, take every opportunity possible and, and trust yourself. And so if I had to wrap it up, it would be entrepreneurs, mindset, community, and fearlessness. Melinda? Um, so I would say definitely do your research and figure out what business, business model is going to work best for you and, and how you like to work and, um, and, and really you know, utilize the uh, roadmap to becoming a travel advisor. Um, because that makes a big difference. You know, starting, starting in one direction and then pivoting is, is a whole other uh, thing that you don't want to do. So really take the time to research that. And then I would say utilize your network. Um, and when I say network, I mean other travel advisors. I mean ASTA chapters, uh, whatever resources your host agency or consortium have. But also business development managers, I think, is something it took me a while to realize um, how valuable our travel industry partners are. Mm -hmm. And they are there not just when things go wrong, they are there to help you sell, to help you learn, to help you grow, to grow your business. And um, they are really, really essential and important parts of our, of our work. So I think utilizing your network there is very important. And then the last thing I would say is um, not every client is a good client. And it's OK to say no. And Charging fees is the best way to vet a client. And I'm not, there are shoppers out there, but there's also people that just have a good idea one day. You know what, I would love to go to Italy. 
and they're gonna call you and they're gonna spend about 30 minutes of your time and if you charge them a fee, then that night they have to go back and really discuss that trip with their family. Well, if you don't charge them a fee, they're not gonna talk about it anymore, but you're gonna start working. So it is a great way to vet uh, clients and it's also really important for your travel industry partners that you're vetting your clients properly because, um, because you don't wanna waste their time and they know that you have a serious traveler, you, you know you have a serious traveler if you're charging fees and if it's not the right fit, you can professionally say no, you can refer them someplace else. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can do it, but so I think that that's a really big time saver and a way to learn how to do business. So what hasn't been said? Uh, <clears throat> I, my first tip always is specialize. You can't be all things to all people. It can be absolutely overwhelming if you think you need to know absolutely everything about every destination, every travel style, it's not gonna happen. So specialize in a product that you're passionate about, in an area that you believe you have access to the right customers for that type of travel. I always believe you wanna learn more about less rather than less about more, and I say that all mm -hmm. the time. Uh, specializing helps not only with your education, it also helps with your marketing. Think about three things. The business you seek, that's your niche. That's, you're gonna go out there and try and get more business like it. The business you'll take, it may not be your area of specialization, but if it comes to you, you're more than happy to take it. I'm not gonna turn down a world cruise request. Uh, you know, I'll take that business even though it might not be something I specialize in. And then, as Melinda said, the business that just is not a good fit. Uh, it doesn't make sense to you, it's not something that you are interested in, and you don't believe you can be that trusted advisor. So that's really, uh, specialized in focus is my number one uh, tip. My number two tip is, as far as your training and development plan, the ASTA uh, introductory programs are fantastic to get a great overview. But then from there, what you wanna do is to make sure that you are targeting uh, your training. Think about what it is that you want to sell, what do you need to know to sell that really well, and then start your education plan about, around that. You can become an education junkie in this industry very easily. And I've spoken to advisors that say, I will sell my first trip when I take three more webinars, four more uh, seminars at sea. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, sometimes, like Nike says, you just have to get out there and do it. And then number three, you don't need to know it all, but you need to know where to find the information. You need to know those resources. Uh, but don't challenge yourself trying to learn absolutely everything, but know those resources that are available to you. All great points that you've made. I would add just one thing, and this is for people that whether they're starting in the business as an employee, you're an entrepreneur starting your own business, find a mentor, find a mentor. I've been blessed through my career to have strong mentors that have helped me on those challenging days when you wanna beat your head up against the wall and ask yourself, why am I in this business? They will share their experiences with you when you think that somebody's just so much more successful than you are. It's not necessarily the case. I pay it forward, I'm also a mentor for others, so I think that's critically important that you find somebody that you can seek advice from from time to time. Well, we have time for one more question. This is a hot one. <laughs> tips for travelers. What tips or insights do you have for those who are traveling in high demand this summer? You know, like the ones that wanna go next week to Italy, <laughs> the Amalfi Coast. <laughs> Or if you just prefer to share a few trends that you're seeing in your business, that, that's, that's fine too. Tiffany, we'll start with you. Um, first, do not go to Italy or Greece um, <laughs> right now. There's already too many people there. There's plenty of other places we can recommend. Um, no, I think it is uh, plan further in advance. That's the biggest thing right now that we're really trying to encourage our clients. Um, you've got to think further ahead and um, you need to, uh, you know, think about, sit down with your family or your friends or whoever you travel with and kind of think about the list. Like, start to be proactive and think further ahead, like years ahead of the places that you really want to go to. And, I mean, 
really number one should be first you need to reach out and, and establish a relationship with a, a travel advisor. I mean, because they're gonna really look after you in the good and the bad times, because we all did a lot of that over the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, plan ahead, have a travel advisor, and from there you can kind of create a roadmap and, and make it happen. Conquer your bucket list. Okay. Isha. And I'll expand travel expectation versus demand. Book early. People need to know that inventory is limited. And so when inventory is limited, prices go up. So book a year in advance. Um, and I just want to touch on that because I think that's so important. Um, but travelers now are seeking purposeful, intentful travel. They are being more mindful of the vacations that they're taking. And for our agency, we are seeing an uptick in, in Southeast Asia, for instance, and river cruising. And I would say use a travel advisor. Uh, be flexible and be kind. Everyone wants you to get to where you need to go, and they want you to have your baggage with you. So, so be, be flexible and be kind, um, and, and I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially this summer. And um, be open to new destinations. And so, you know, I mean, places in Italy have been sold out since February for the summer. So find, there's a lot of other great places that are off the beaten path where you can have a fantastic ex or similar experience. So be open to, to new destinations. And um, yeah, I think that's yeah. One thing I, I will add, uh, is to not wait until you're in destination to try and get that restaurant reservation, to try and get tickets to the hottest attractions. Really sit down with the travel advisor, talk about what it is that you want to do on that trip, what it is you want to get out of it. As Keisha said, uh, it, you know, people are looking for more purposeful experiences, but then have that travel advisor help to secure those things so that you're not disappointed when you get to your destination and realize, what do you mean I had to book that four months ago? Because that is happening to a lot of folks that they are not able to get what they want once they get there. So. Without a doubt. Some data points again. 47% of consumers ranked a vacation as their top discretionary spend. Can you believe that? So my advice would also be not only book in advance, but save in advance. If you really want a fantastic vacation, you need to budget for one. On the corporate side, since I'm wearing both hats, corporate travelers need to plan in advance because the planes are filled with leisure travelers. <laughs> so their upgrades that they thought would be automatic before are not necessarily happening because those cabins are full. When is the last time you all have been on a flight that wasn't packed to the gills? Long time, right? Mm -hmm. So good, good on our airline carrier sitting here. We love you. But give us some more planes. Hurry up <laughs> so we can sell them for you. <laughs> so with that, that's the end of our panel today. I hope you all learned something and enjoyed these fantastic powerhouse women sharing their journey with their careers. And we thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>